Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Purang Dhammang Sangang Namasami So most of you know that was an invitation that's traditional in our lineage, uh, mimicking or quoting the words of, in the stories that have come down to us, Baka the Brahma, or sorry, um, Sahampati, asking the Buddha to teach. And these rituals are um, really beautiful technologies for catalyzing and marshalling kind of the, the forces of the spirit and heart which are deeper down below the surface, the sort of union substrate. So the bowing, the ritual, the statuary, um, these are skillful means. Some of you might know a book that recently came out uh, called Running Towards Mystery and it's the story of the childhood, uh, an autobiography of Tenzin Piyadarshi, who's the president and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethical and Value Transformation Studies at MIT. And he tells his story of growing up in a Brahmin family in India with no knowledge of Buddhism, but he kept having these visions of a monk or of a bald guy in a blanket because <laughs> he didn't know what a monk was. And when he was 10, he felt so drawn that he walked out of school, um, got on a bus, and just rode it until, I think for a day and a half, uh, and then he got off the bus when it reached the end of the line and got on a different one. And he ended up, randomly, at Vulture's Peak, which is where the Buddha gave a great deal of his teachings and walked into a monastery there. And on the shrine was the picture of the man he'd seen in his visions. And it was uh, Fuji Guruji, who is the monk who for years built these peace pagodas after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, and he built these beautiful peace pagodas in all these different countries, including Rajagir uh, in India. So 10-year-old Piyadarshi found his way there and just started scrubbing the floors and stayed for weeks until his parents managed to track him down and bring him back home. And the next 20 years of his life were a struggle of trying to hold, because uh, his family was not supportive of his, he decided he wanted to be a monk at 10 years old, and holding that vision. And he talks about coming to a point where he was 17 years old, and he'd been holding uh, the novice precepts this whole time alone, just in his home. And his practice had become joyless and dry. And one night he was in his house in Delhi with his parents and heard this music from down the street. And he wandered down to it and saw lights on in this upstairs room and wandered up the stairs. And there was a uh, kirtan, which is a sort of great Hindu dance and all these people uh, worshiping and dancing and symbols and music, all the fun stuff we don't have quite as much of in the Theravada. <laughs> and and uh, and he just felt this joy, and this small man at the end of the night came up to him and said something to him. And he went back home and went to bed, but he couldn't fall asleep. And so the next morning, he, he knew he had to find this place again, so he retraced his steps and found his way to this house in the middle of the day and walked into the door and was led up the stairs by the resident uh, guru. And he said, I, I was here last night for the kirtan, and I, I want, I, I met this, this uh, rishi, I, I want to talk to him again. 
And the steward of the temple said, there, there was no kirtan last night. Uh, there was nothing here. And, but this is the temple. And he opened the door, and on the shrine, there was a picture of three men, and one of them was this uh, yogi. And Pierre Darshi said, that, that's the man I talked to. I want to talk to him again. And the steward said, uh, he's been dead five years. You know, this, it's impossible. You can't have talked to him. And Pierre Darshi went back home and decided that teachers will come on their own time, in their own ways, that he didn't understand. But the words of this one teacher echoed in his heart for the rest of his life. And what the teacher had said is, is there so much joy in your religion? Is there so much joy in your religion? And he said this to a spiritual aspirant who was tired and grim and trying to hold his practice together in the midst of a world and family which were not supportive. And he was saying, where's the joy? Where have you lost that? And Piyadarshi describes it as this great somersault over all the conditions which had kept him trapped. And the horizon broadened and brightened. Some of you might know a story of, there was a monk giving a talk in Bangkok in a temple there, and he was late. So while they were waiting, the resident monastics asked a different monk who was there to give the talk. And his talk was titled, Buddhism is all about suffering. And gave the talk, and then the other monk came, and they decided they have time, had time for him to give the talk, so he got up on the stage and gave a talk labeled, titled, Buddhism is all about happiness. So what do we do with this? We speak about the Four Noble Truths in suffering, the tasks associated with them. The first noble truth to comprehend dukkha, our stress, our suffering, our struggle. The second, to let go of its cause, craving, tanha, thirst unwholesome craving. The third noble truth, to realize the cessation of dukkha, peace. And the fourth, to develop the path out of, to that cessation of dukkha, the noble eightfold path. And it certainly seems to revolve around suffering. It definitely labels dukkha right there in the front. But this is because it's what we turn away from. We have no trouble turning towards happiness but what we ignore and run from and negotiate with and close our eyes to is the difficulty. And so the Buddha turns us around and says, look at this, comprehend this, and you will find joy. You will find happiness. You'll find peace if you let go of the craving below the surface of dukkha. And it's, it's hard. Like, how do you articulate what good health is? You articulate it by saying what it's not. It's, I'm not sick. I don't have an ailment. But as to what good health looks like, it's hard to say exactly. So you say by, you describe it by what it's not. And similarly in Buddhism, we're moving towards happiness, but we're talking about it, towards peace. But often we're talking in terms of what we're letting go of to get there. But to make no mistake, the Buddha said this path was beautiful in the beginning Beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. Adi Kalyanang, Maji Kalyanang, Pariyasana Kalyanang. And Kalyana, that's a word to remember. It means beautiful, as in Kalyana Mitta, beautiful friend. It's a particular spiritual beauty. And as you progress on this path, as you meet people who are bright and beautiful and radiant, you begin to know what it means to fall in love in a spiritual sense. People think, you know, you ordain and you give up love, but I, I've never fallen in love as much as when I met the teachers who shook my heart. You know, that's, for me, real. It's a real form of love. And this is Kalyana, beautiful. And similarly, the Buddha pointed out the importance of joy. There's what we call the joy cascade, which the Buddha speaks about again and again. Uh, he talks about it in the sutta on dependent, transcendent dependent origination and in many contexts where he says X, which you can replace with morality or 
uh, appropriate attention, or there's various different beginning points, leads to joy, pamoja. Pamoja leads to rapture, rapture to tranquility, tranquility to sukha, ease. Ease to the concentrated mind, the concentrated mind to knowledge and vision, knowledge and vision to liberation. Liberation to knowledge and vision of liberation. And then sometimes he'll double back and say, the happy mind is easily concentrated. Why does he double back there? Why does he make us remember that it's not that we get our samadhi together, our concentration, and then finally we'll be happy. It's that when we're happy, in a wholesome sense, that's when the concentration comes together. That's when the mind is willing to unify. How do we find joy? And to understand that Freud spoke about two instincts in the human heart. There's eros, which is the life instinct towards creation, towards moving into the world, towards wholeness. And then there's thanatos, the death instinct, which he may well have gotten from Schopenhauer and originally from Buddhism, actually. But it aligns very well with vibhava tanha, the craving not to become, the craving towards death. And when someone socialized into society, the, uh, Freud said that aggressive instinct gets turned inwards as the superego. And it takes on this aggressive tone. And we know this well, most of us. This is the voice that says, you're not good enough. You need to give up more. You need to be better. You're not doing enough. And we come and we touch these teachings and we intuit their power and we want to give our heart to them. And often we don't have enough roots, roots for eros, so we pour ourselves into thanatos, the superego and renunciation. I need to sleep less, eat l less, sleep less. I need to uh, you know, cut myself off from this and this and this and this. And there is a place in Buddhism for renunciation, but and many of the teachings you'll hear from the Thai force tradition or the Buddha's time are phrased in those terms because those teachings are given in the context of a society which is profoundly integrated, where in the villages in Thailand, you know, you're a, a small, you, you'll see the small kids being taken care of by the four houses or five houses next to one another. There's this sense of metta and uplift and community and interweaving that frame every teaching you hear from that region, uh, at least in the past. It's quickly becoming globalized. But then you take those teachings and you transplant them here, and what we hear is give up more, renounce more, and it's like mixing acid with acid. And you see so many Westerners, so many moderns, just enacting these modes of violence on themselves, which are not joyful. And you see that wellspring of joy in the heart get clogged up and that wellspring of life slowly dry and there's a brittleness. So how do we find roots? And I don't think Eros totally aligns with wholesome in every sense, but there is something in Eros which aligns with Chanda. In Buddhism, there's two modes of desire. There's tanha, which is thirst, which feeds off of the world. It's craving. It's always unwholesome, and it always leads to suffering. And then there's chanda. And chanda is often spoke of, spoken of in this sense of wholesome zeal, a desire towards wholeness, a sincerity on the path. It can be joyful and wholesome and loving. This is chanda. I think it has more to do with, the, do with the dopamine system, and tana has more to do with the serotonin system. And I think chanda aligns in many cases with eros. So how do we find roots for our hearts? How do we find joy and nourishment and vitality in this path? A good metric for your practice is normalcy, flourishing, and warmth. Nor normalcy, flourishing, and warmth. That's a good sign. If there's a sense of violence, of dryness, of self-flagellation, you know that you're not on the middle path. 
So is there so much joy in your religion? The Buddha spoke of many roots to joy. And one of my favorites is he talks about this in the Mahanama Sutta. And he says, when one recollects the Tathagata, the, the Buddha, one, one's mind is not overcome with delusion, not overcome with greed, not overcome with hatred. When the mind is thus oriented, it gains faith, a sense of the Dhamma, a sense of the meaning, joy connected with the Dhamma. In one who is joyful, rapture springs up. The rapturous mind is easily concentrated. It is said that in the midst of those who dwell out of tune, such a one dwells in tune. And even so, one recollects the Tathagata. And then he says the same for the Dhamma, the teachings, and the Sangha. And there's so much there. One is to understand that as we touch these teachings more, there's a genuine sense of beauty and joy there. There are monks who, when they recollect Ajahn Chah, they just have tears come down their, their face. Uh, Long Propasano speaks, I heard someone ask him once, what's the most beautiful act of giving you've ever seen? And he referenced Ajahn Chah who became paralyzed about 10 years after he, before he died. And Ajahn Pasana said, I think Ajahn Chah could have let go of his body at any point, but he hung on for 10 years because what that allowed to happen was the Sangha, the community, had time to orient and crystallize and solidify so that when Ajahn Chah died, it didn't just dissolve. And Ajahn Long Prapasana said that was his gift to us, those 10 years of waiting in a paralyzed body. That was the most beautiful act of giving I've ever seen. And then as you practice, you meet these other teachers who are so beautiful. And that can be a meditation subject, the joy that comes from that. And when we bow, it's just a statue. But there's a Jungian substrate to the psyche, to the heart, which speaks in the language of ritual, embodiment, and story. And this is something that's been lost in nice, sterile, secular Western Dharma circles. We, it's like we're trying to create this crystalless or cr crust of intellectual orderliness. And make no mistake, that's very present in the teachings. These are crystalline, elegant teachings. But what we forget is there's this roiling undercurrent of the heart and its forces. And when those aren't marshaled and crystallized and settled through story, through ritual, through embodiment, through these technologies, through these skillful means, it's like ocean waves underneath a thin veil of ice and there's always this cracking and sense of non-settledness. So when we bow, it's just skillful means but it's powerful, skillful means. And this is a way of orienting towards joy, towards dhamma, and sensing that when you bow first thing in the morning and last thing at night, when you recollect the teachers who you love, when you recollect these teachings which are so profound, is there that sense of uplift? And the next three in the sutta, the Buddha says, one recollects one's giving and says, among the, those who are stingy, one dwells without stinginess, open-handed, responsive to requests, freely giving of alms. And many of you will know that the Buddha said that if beings knew as I knew the fruits of giving, they never would eat without first having given, not if it was their last mouthful, if there was someone to share it with, they would always give. But because beings do not know, as I know, the fruits of giving, they eat without having given, and stinginess overcomes their minds. So to recollect that, the Buddha encouraged the monastics, if we have any grains of rice in our bowl, we're supposed to dump them into the forest and recollect, may this feed the beings here, may this go to benefit the little cr critters. I think I've done that with a Swedish fish or a, no, there's a gummy bear 
in a, in a Bayagiri and someone tossed it out into the yard and the, the rabbit found it. And then we had a lecture from the co-abbot saying, you guys have to stop feeding the rabbits gummies. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it lived. I can't be sure. <laughs> but the metta was there. The metta was there. So giving. And to make this central, the Buddha said there were six objects of reverence, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, heedfulness, training, and the sixth is hospitality, receiving guests. And what a list, because the first five, you know, we hear that and we're like, all right, I'm doubling down, I'm going to just go to my room and meditate, heedfulness, the training, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. And then the Buddha puts that sixth in there, where you're forced to put down all that and just be available for who comes to your door receive guests. And I remember at Wat Mopjan, where I ordained, I was uh, a very serious young monk. Um, my parents would often call me and say, have you made any friends? And I'd say, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my tune after a while. But, uh, but anyway, so I was very focused on being a great meditator and all this. And then I got designated as the guest monk. And our coordinator would forget to tell me that by the way, a group of 25 Malaysian 50-year-olds are coming today, and you need to prepare uh, huts for all of them. And it was initially suffering. And then when I decided this is my practice to receive, to be hospitable, to be caring, to give myself completely, it became the most beautiful part for a time of my holy life. We've forgotten what it means to be hospitable at that level. There's a monk I knew who stayed at a Christian monastery, and the monks at the Christ Christian monastery had a rule that if someone walked into the room, if they didn't have a cup of tea in that person's hand in two minutes, then they'd failed. And similarly, um, I lived with a, a wonderful monk uh, named Adrian, and he talked about his time in Japan, and he said, if you visit a Japanese person's house, and comment on how nice you think a painting is on the wall, there's about a 50% chance they'll, chance they'll give you the painting right away. What would it mean to hold hospitality at that level of sanctity and see the joy in it? So I really want to encourage that is, you know, we have a Mitta Meetups page on the website. Uh, we have some who've begun to list things there, but. Consider opening your house once every two weeks, once a week, and just invite people over to eat, feed them. You know, it's that simple, but there's so much joy. And if there's that part of you that says, I don't have time, I just don't have the energy, then this is exactly where you need to give. Whenever I have a metric where I try to, you know, we try to take gifts with us when we travel on planes to give away. And you always hit that point where you're like, oh man, like, this is heavy. I think that's about enough. I think there's a really good argument to be made for whenever you hit that point, you, you put in the extra thing. Always you push past that point because real Donna hurts a little bit because that's how you know you're really letting go of the self and that's where joy hides, just on the other end of that stingy part. So give. Make much of that. Then the Buddha says, one recollects one's own morality saying, one recollects one's morality is untorn, unspotted, unsplattered. And there's this phrase in the suttas that, like so many, takes on power over time, that one becomes sensitive to the joy of being blameless. And that sense, if one holds the precepts, and it's a delayed joy. We don't know what we're missing until we've come to that point where we are so unfamiliar with killing that when you see someone slap a mosquito, there's this sense of like, oh my God, what a beautiful reaction to have. And where you know I will never lie, like I will not lie. That doesn't mean you say everything that comes into your head. It means you can be skillful. Um, but you, that sense of cleanliness of unsplattered cloth, of untorn cloth in the heart is so beautiful. And there's a real sense of 
Uh, the Buddha labeled it anavacha sukha, blameless happiness. And this extends to restraining one's actions and what input one takes. As one practices, those metrics of um, right and wrong, you know, late, mainly we've given up what's wrong, but a language which becomes very relevant is trivial and non-trivial, beautiful and non-beautiful. So can we make our lives into these works of art? Can we make them beautiful in every sense? And there's a, a sutta where the Buddha says that one who dwells without restraint over the eye forms taken in by the eye stain the mind. In one whose mind is stained, joy does not arise. When joy does not arise, rapture does not arise. When rapture does not arise, the mind is not calm. When the mind is not calm, one dwells in pain. And it's so opposite how we think. You know, usually we think the more we take in, the, this is how we get happiness. But this is one of the secrets is that the sense of triviality becomes painful when you know you're wasting your time when you know you're watching the movie that shouldn't, there's a subtle sense of kind of a razor blade of dharma circling around the heart. Just, you know, you know you're meant for more than this. This is not worth it. You've watched enough Marvel Cinematic Universe movies and, and it's painful. And then you find that you can step things down. You can take a walk with beautiful people, you can have a conversation, you can listen to a Dhamma talk, and there's beauty there, and it's not painful. But the Buddha said that the world, what the world considers pleasurable, the noble ones consider painful, and what the noble ones consider pleasure, the world considers painful. We live, Eden is waiting right in front of us, but it is a mere image, a photographic negative of what the world wants us to see. It's like seeing those trees of light in between normal trees. We just have to reverse everything. Some of you might know this Seinfeld episode with George Costanza, who I haven't seen this episode, um, but he decides for a whole episode to do the exact opposite of what he'd usually do, and he's much happier. So the Dhamma can be our George Costanza moment, switching. So these are all skillful means. The, the Buddha finishes that sutta by talking about recollection of the qualities of the devas in in, internally. But we often need skillful means to find joy. What roots to eros and chanda do we have within this community, within this path? Because we're giving up so much of the way we've consumed the world, and yet we need to commune with the world. So our choice is to move from consuming to giving. That's the switch. It's not cutting off. We do try to s cultivate these internal sources of happiness. And the Buddha spoke about different levels of happiness. There's sami sasuka, which is worldly happiness of consuming through the senses, which never satisfies. Then there's nirami sasuka, which is spiritual happiness. And that's these internal wellsprings of happiness that are not fragile, and they're more subtle, and they're not dependent on the body behaving the way you want it to behave, or getting the sights and sounds and tastes that you want to get, or the people you love acting like you think they should act. This is the pleasure, near Misasuka, of a pure heart, of loving kindness, of samadhi and of the path. And I find art can be such a beautiful route to that. Yes, giving can. Yes, ritual and recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha can. Yes, recollection of virtue and giving can. But also to find other routes to joy that feel wholesome. And when one thinks of this place of beauty, Art used in line with the Four Noble Truths can be used well. Art can let us metabolize suffering. There's a way you never feel worse about something after writing it out. It always makes you feel better. And there's a way that a poem 
or a painting or a dance can help you reframe and settle the suffering in yourself and put it on paper or put it you know, on canvas. One function of mindfulness is putting things in order by naming them. But there's a whole realm of sufferings and joys and movements of the heart which need a different language to settle them. And this can be the language of art. So, you know, really trying to find your root to joy in that way. And for me, it has a feel of metta, making an art as gift to someone. And I know people who paint, who write poetry. I once asked Tenzin Palmo if it was all right to write poetry as a monk, and she said, yeah, like my teacher writes. Um, and to find that root, if it's something that rings true to you, the Buddha spoke about these qualities of discrimination of patisambhita. He said, one who attains these five discriminations or these five qualities attains unshakable liberation. Discrimination of meanings, of dhamma, of language, patibana, which is creativity, quick-wittedness, and reflection on the enlightened mind, the liberated mind. And so the first three have to do with tracing things back, learning how to use language or the medium of expression, but then also discrimination of dhamma and of principles, of binding one's expressions back to the heart, the core of dhamma. But then that fourth, patibana, is playfulness, is creativity. The Buddha said, uh, designated one monk named Vanisa, who was a poet, and spontaneously uh, said these beautiful verses. He said he was foremost in patibana. So there's a place for this. And it's something a lot of senior practitioners use. Ajahn Suchito writes poetry. Ajahn Amaro writes books. Um, I know Aj Longpur Titadamo paints and draws. Um, there's a place for this creativity, um, for finding a route to that joy, to metabolize suffering, and then to call to and speak to those elements of the wide, broad, joyful mind, and finding and cultivating that. And this has been the main tool that the West has had, because it hasn't, in Christian tradition, had as much focus on samadhi or meditation, but they have had art and liturgy. And can we find a route to joy there? So uh, I wish everyone the best in this. Han tamayang tamakata ya sa tu karan tadama se sa tu sa tu sa tu anu tami. So um, people can feel free to, an hour and a half is a long time to sit, so feel free to stand or move around do a jumping jack or two, um, but we have time for questions or discussion now. So if people want to raise your hand, we'll have a mic runner come over to you, or if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and we can call on you. Is and I think we might have one on Zoom. Is that correct? Kathy, Kathy online. Please. A second. Okay, we can hear you, Kathy. There. Um, yeah, when you were doing the um, meditation about um, think of giving and get joy from it, all I could think of was all the giving I've done where the receiver just didn't receive and there wasn't joy. Like, I I don't know quite how to put it, but with family in particular and even with neighbors, like I had a neighbor who was, her husband was dying and I offered her some food and she just said like, no, it's okay, I'm good. <laughs> and, I'm, and I had made it specially for her and I'm like, okay. And just, 
other things where I've helped people and then they've turned turned on me and gossiped and or another neighbor I used to do her shopping for two years and she'd say what what I got wrong you know oh this isn't the brand I wanted um, with family I've you know I picked up my household and moved across the country to be with grandchildren and now I'm pretty much shut out of everybody's life and it's like wow you know so how does that fit into I mean I I know we don't have expectations and I've I've only done it out of love but when you keep getting okay. um like it doesn't seem to lead to joy I guess so so thank what can I do about that? <laughs> thank you thank you Kathy like I don't want to stop giving <laughs> no thank thank you I think um you bring up a really in good point um, in that that those recollections of goodness have a similar flavor to metta practice where they seem so bright and shiny that it's almost entrancing and we forget that good metta practice and good recollection of giving um, they're related <coughs> require real agility and the agility is the movement. In, in some sense, you could think of those practices as the fourth noble truth. It's the path. It's a very focused technique, bringing up bright states. But all those practices always require in the periphery the first noble truth to be there. Because so often, like, just we're not in that fourth noble truth place. Like, what comes up is being slighted or the sense of loneliness or, you know, even resentment or just lack of joy. And in such cases, the correct motion of the heart often is first not to use those as your meditation recollection um, specifically, <laughs> but, but secondly to, um, and this is really important, is to, to come back to feeling compassion for yourself. So instead of trying to kind of power through to feel joy in that action of giving, just say, ow, like that really hurt and there's a sense of loneliness and holding yourself with this sort of quiet, much more human and humble sense of loving kindness. Because it doesn't really matter who you're spreading loving kindness to, and it doesn't matter if it's this bright, shiny state. Sometimes that sense of quiet, humble compassion for yourself, of just listening and feeling the bruise, that's the correct motion. And letting the bruise kind of move through your body, there's no way of rushing that I haven't found. But that's the correct motion of metta. And, and then to, when you can't spread metta to someone or when you're not able to bring that recollection, instead of trying to power through it and spread metta to that person that you really don't want to spread metta to, just seeing how that severing of yourself from the world hurts. You've, you've been orphaned and you don't want to be orphaned and it hurts to be orphaned. And you know, with the people closest to you, that's often where it really manifests. And in that case, just holding yourself in the first noble truth of comprehending your own suffering and holding yourself in that, I think it's a much more humble motion of metta. It's not as bright and shiny, but it's, it's so important to pass through that dark valley sometimes before you can come to those brighter places and recollections. Did that make any sit at all well, Kathy? Well, I certainly can identify with the term being orphaned. I've always felt, but I never would have used that word, but it, it certainly resonates. So I guess I'm in that orphan stage right now. And, you know, the secret, I think partially <clears throat> is that that's how you touch the suffering of, of all beings. You know, like we all are in that orphan state. We just don't realize it at times. And and there is also community and resonance and connection. Um, but it's true that you probably, you know, picking those carefully, um, those relationships where people will be thankful if you can, and then letting go of the other ones if you're able. You don't happen to be near Seattle, do you? No, uh, we, I'm in Canada and our, 
our sense of Kellyanne and Mita here is very underdeveloped. Okay. Um, and I'm so in awe of your um, sangha there, and it's just too much for me to travel to Seattle now. I'm I'm a senior, and it's to drive there is just too much, and then I can't afford the cost of having to stay somewhere. So. I just, you know, I figure, well, I've got Zoom, so I'll just participate. So today I'm going to be on the coffee time okay. Great. Yeah, with Ka people. So, Kathy, please. So I don't, I don't have the real concrete people, but I've got the Zoom people. So the Zoom people are all right. They're great, and uh, <laughs> and know that if you do come down here, we'll find a place for you to stay. And that goes for others on the Zoom as best we can. Just. Tune into the Wednesday Zooms and say that you're coming down, and we have got hospitality stewards that can help with that. So, good good luck, Kathy, and, and welcome. And you're not alone in this one. Uh, that's that's deep suffering, and um, yeah, we get well, it. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it, and thank you for for doing what you're doing for establishing this this monastery and this sangha. It's, I, I've watched it grow from the beginning, and it's just mind blowing. So. Um, yeah, we didn't have a rug Much then. Credit. We have a rug now. <laughs> yes, I see. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, John, for teaching today. Hey, so when in the practice, what I noticed come up right away was I was recollecting my giving, and then I saw it was a little bit of an ouch. It was like, oh, but I... Like that act of giving was to reify a sense of like that I have a good self, like to be a good person. And it seemed a little off. So I kept on searching for like true, like um, what is the word just where you give freely. Like, um, and I did find one and stayed with that. But what does one do with all of those other acts? Like. I'm thinking of like a neighbor of mine. I bring her mail in, but I kind of do it to be a good neighbor, but I don't really want to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, so yeah. Like, what do you do with, with those parts? Yeah, great question. The Buddha spoke about seven reasons to give. And he says the first is one gives in hope of getting something in return. So may this come back to me in some sense or like even a karmic fruit. Um, one gives because it's good, one gives because one thinks this person does not have as much as me, it's right for me to give. And then so on until number six is one gives with the thought, when I give, the mind becomes settled and calm. And then the seventh is one gives as an ornament of the mind. And the thing is, the Buddha doesn't devalue the first ones. Like, you know, we have Mara right sidecar for most of our actions, even the path, like, it takes a strong act of crystallizing the self to initially swim against the stream. And so like people come onto the path and initially there can be quite a lot of um, conceit and proselytizing to your family, which is really annoying to them. And, um, <laughs> you know, and looking down on others and you just notice that and try to let it go. But the, we have egos and it, it's, it's kind of just part of the mix. Um, and sometimes that first recollection of giving because something will come back to you, it can be useful. Like uh, sometimes, you know, you're like, I really don't want to give the big piece of cake. And then you're like, you know, karmically, maybe next life I'll have a bigger piece of cake. I'm going to get, you know, and like it's stupid, it's silly, but the act of giving is so powerful that the glow kind of overwhelms and dissolves some of that later to the point where it's still worth doing. So. I'd say, yeah, to find a completely selfless act is hard. It's okay if there's a little bit of self hidden in there. You, you rejoice in the good parts, and those are worth so much. And it's inevitable the ego will kind of be a, what are those little fish that suck onto the bottom of sharks and stuff? Lamprey or something? Remora. Yeah. Gamo what? Remora. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Hey, Bhante. I don't know if this is helpful or not, but I, it came up while you were speaking, and then you sort of circled around to it, but you didn't phrase it exactly like this. 
so I wanted to offer to the community. You had said in times of uh, shifting from a position of consumption to one of generosity. And something I've been doing a lot lately, sometimes in the moment of consumption, 8 p.m., and YouTube is really easy, and the Marvel comic universe is vast, um, instead of generosity in that moment, which might be a bridge too far, or I'm not even sure what I would do to be generous in that moment, shifting from consumption to creativity. And if one is lucky, maybe one's creative place, and if not can be cultivated in this direction, is one of generosity. But for me, that's been a good, oh, I feel, I feel the need to consume. Can I create instead as a, as a replacement? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's so beautiful. And it's absolutely like if you can find a creative outlet, then it's such a strength and wellspring of, of goodness and metta and giving and kind of communion. So that's beautiful. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering, because you had been talking about joy and kind of cultivating it, um, I have the impression, for example, like Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, like that story about that guy, like finding hope and joy and stuff in like terrible circumstances. And I was wondering, uh, is it possible you could offer um, maybe a Dhammic perspective on those kinds of situations? Yeah. I think there's um, a few ways of talking about it. One is, you know, the language of privilege as it's used these days is problematic in some ways. I mean, it's a relevant discussion in a lot of cases, and we are extremely privileged, many of us. But in Thailand, I met Burmese immigrant workers in shanties behind the monastery that were far happier than a lot of the upper middle class Westerners I know here. And, and just to say that, like, this doesn't apply to what Viktor Frankl's saying exactly, but just to say that I find joy comes from how well your life is aligned to Dhamma in, in a real sense. And that can manifest in a lot of different circumstances, some which can be quite difficult externally. There's a whole book by Rebecca Solnit called Paradise Built in Hell. And it's about these really difficult situations where people came together because the difficult situation was, was really uh, harrowing the carpet bombing of London during the World War II and those a lot of them recollect those as the best points in their lives so not to underestimate the how much suffering we have as siloed isolated people in modern America our suffering is very real um, and it doesn't mean we you know we take joy in the parts we have but also just to question the external valuation of how good a situation is, I think, from the get-go. Any situation approached through the Four Noble Truths has the potential to issue into liberation, letting go, learning. But I would also say that there's something in there, it's important to emphasize joy, but to understand that as a final metric, that language doesn't always hold. Purpose holds us. and to really understand that if you've come in contact with teachings this deep in a world that's suffering this much with this many lonely people, you have a duty insofar as you want to take it on to embody those well and to love those around us really selflessly and that requires practice and training of the mind. And joy hides on the other side of duty. Like C.S. Lewis said, I think I quoted this um, a bit ago, but like, if one searches for truth, if one searches for truth, one may find joy in the end, comfort in the end. But if one searches for comfort, one will find neither truth nor comfort, but only soft soap and wishful thinking in the beginning, and in the end, despair. And there's another great quote um, by a, a teacher that said that, I dreamt that life was a joy. I woke and found that life was a duty. I acted and behold, duty was a joy. So. You know, this is a good metric for life, and in terms of condensing that down to that specific moment and something as extreme as Viktor Frankl's reference there, 
you know, it, it's hard for me to speak to a circumstance like that, but I, I can say that the Four Noble Truths, all four, including liberation, are available in any moment. And that's the beauty of karma that the Buddha said was beyond dark and bright, is that it issues to liberation and it transmutes every other karma into the path. So, thank you, Trenton. We have to wrap things up, I think. Um, maybe one more for person on Zoom in the top left. Who is it? Koda, please. Koda. Hello, Arjun. Thank you. In the phrase, in one who is joyful, rapture springs up. Can you explain what it means for rapture to spring up? Thank you. What's, what's on the background behind your shoulder? That is my therapy Buddha bear with oh, his mala. I'm so glad I asked about that. I that's keep him on the right. That's, that's delightful. <laughs> um, uh, didn't know I'd get that answer. That was a good answer. <laughs> um, the word for rapture, so pamoja is joy. Rapture is pity. And pity actually comes etymologically from the word to drink. So I've heard it almost better translated, I think in some cases, as refreshment. So it, it can be a very refined of the sense of kind of refreshment and nourishment and like soaking up something. But what I think of it as, as is say you're spreading metta and there's this sense of kind of, I was so hungry for this sense of love and the sense of it kind of pervading and soaking into the body. For me, that, that's sort of associated with pity or rapture. Whereas pamoja, the prerequisite, joy, is more of a broad state that's much more accessible in daily life of just what does it feel like to feel like your sila is pure? What does it feel like to give? And on that foundation, the more refined notes of pity or rapture can manifest. Did that help at all, Go to Okay. So we should wrap up. Um, maybe we could read the blessing braid and the chanting request. Okay. Let's get there. Oops, sorry. We're getting there. Um, Greg died on Wednesday. Denise Duclos has just been diagnosed with cancer for a second time. Please send care, love, and acceptance. Naomi Stenberg, suffering from depression. Glenn Lorenzen, for a fortunate rebirth and for healing for family members, especially Christian, Jan, and Donna, who didn't get to say goodbye. Sunny Miller passed away last week. Spread loving kindness for a good rebirth and grace for her family and daughter, Axel. Tom Addison in hospice, please send Metta for a good rebirth and to his wife, Natalie. Chitta Paula, suffering great mental, physical difficulty and possibly near the end of life, spread love. Betty Thomas has been in hospice since 129.24 with illness, please send care. And that's hospital, not hospice for Betty. Thank hospice. goodness. Hospital. Okay. <laughs> just to be ah, clear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Her daughter's here right now. I just don't want to alarm anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have other names of people to hold in our hearts right now? Kirk. And Alfred Man Manitz for a good rebirth. Alfred. John Church. What's her name? Leslie, uh, Axel's grandmother and Sonny's mother. May she find peace now. John Church, who has cancer. Okay. Is that loud enough? Oh, it's in the end. Jeff, who has painful knees. Juanita's brother, who has kidney failure and surgery, and then double bypass for his son. Marianne, John's mom. Mark, in and out of hospice. Dory. Charles. Ross, recovering from surgery. Chitapala. Chitapala. Kathy. 
So just recollecting these people, holding them in our hearts, and the practices for them too. Page 83, verses on the Buddha's first exclamation. You can find the link in the Zoom chat, YouTube description, page 83. Handamayam patama buddha basita gatayo banamase Aneka jati sang sarang sandawi sang hani bi sang Gaha karang gawe santo dukha jati puna punang For many lifetimes in the round of birth Wandering on endlessly For the builder of this house I searched how painful is repeated birth. Gaha kara gadi tosi puna gehang na kahasi. Saba te pasu gabaga kaha kutang wisang katang. Wisang kara gatang chitang tanhanang kaya hachaga. House builder you've been seen. Another home you will not build. All your rafters have been snapped. Dismantled is your rich pole. The non-constructing mind has come to craving's end. So for those who are brave and who've been here three times or less, if you want to, you can be brave without.